The Lord be with you, and let us pray. Beloved and sovereign God, through the death and the resurrection of your Son, you bring us into your kingdom of justice and mercy. By your Spirit, give us your wisdom, that we may treasure the life that comes from Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea 
and caught fish of every kind. And when it was full, they drew it ashore and sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where they will be weeping in the gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? And they answered, yes. And he said to them, every scribe who has been trained in the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. As the first line of our opening hymn, praise to the God of Abraham who has come to set us free. When Martin Luther King Jr., Dr. King, finished his PhD at Boston University, he went back south, expecting to become a preacher, hopefully as good as his father, Martin Luther King Sr., because of his oratory skills, became well known rather quickly and because of that. People came to him and said, we need you to be a leader, a leader in the justice, the fight for justice for the blacks of America. And at first, he did not like the idea. He didn't know why he had to do that. He, all he wanted to do was become a good preacher. But he let himself in. And in that moment of time, he didn't know what had happened. But what happened to him was this. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. He would, did not know that he would be that yeast, that leaven of flour of people who needed to rise and hear the voices heard. And as he was on the radio, a young man heard him. And this young man was brought up one of nine children of sharecroppers and he had a bent toward religion himself. And the story goes that even at an early age, he used to practice his preaching skills to the chickens, the chicken coop. This is how he started. Well, they couldn't complain, they couldn't criticize. And then one day, his brother relates the story that one of the chickens died. And John took his brother with him and said, we must bury the chicken, and so they did. And they had a funeral service, a place to cross and the funeral of the chicken, the burial of the chicken. And it was in his mind, of course, that he too would become a preacher. After all, he had so admired uh, Martin Luther King that at that moment in time, sooner or later, before he went into college and listening to King, he suddenly knew what he had to do. And putting aside everything else, any other dreams he had of what he was going to do, he did this. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of a fine pearl. And finding one of great value, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought that. And it was in that decision that would irrevocably change his life. And so at the young age of 23, he was the youngest person ever to speak to the huge crowd of 250,000 people assembled in Washington. And he spoke just before Dr. Martin Luther King's famous I Have a Dream speech. And so it was that he became so deeply involved that his whole foundation of his Christian learning became part of his whole life itself as it entered into the marches as they crossed that faithful bridge in Selma when he was hit, struck to the ground. And as he hit the ground, he thought, I might be dying. I might be dying. But he said, I wasn't afraid. For some reason, I wasn't afraid. And it conjures up an image, does it not, of Jesus speaking, do good to the people who are your enemies. Love them in return. John's life was filled. Everything he did was kind of a foundational effect of what he thought Christianity and what God was about and what Jesus was about. And so he goes further, becomes part of the Students for Democratic Society, he leads it. And all of a sudden, he's thrust even further. He is one of the people that is, always seems to be 
at Martin Luther King's side. And so many things happened throughout the years. No one would have thought that he would enter Congress into the House and be called the conscience of that House. And then later on in years, so many different things happened that opened up to what a man that was so thoroughly imbued with the spirit of Christ. There was the time where a man of advanced years came to him when John was, I believe, 78 years old. He was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and over the years, he had thought about what had happened because he was one of the people who were on the attack, both verbally and physically. And so, for some reason, the kingdom of God is like that pearl that some people discover later in life. And when this white man discovered it, he went and was able to see John. And he confessed to him what he'd done. And he asked for John's forgiveness. And John not only spoke the words, he leaned over and he embraced the man who had so persecuted him. But the pearl of great price comes also early. There was a young 10 year old boy in Tennessee who upon hearing John give a speech, somehow had the realization that what he was hearing was not only truthful, but it came from the very soul of what the Holy Spirit might be all about. And so when John Lewis went down for the 50th anniversary of the crossing of that bridge in Selma, he begged his grandmother to drive him nine hours to be down there, hoping to catch a glimpse of his hero, John. Lewis. And he stood outside the church where John was preaching, and he had a sign out there to thank him for giving him the courage to speak the truth. And John came down the stairs and he saw the boy, and he looked at the sign, and he got down and he shook the boy's hand, and he asked where he was from, and he said, from Tennessee. John knew he had to travel a long time. And there was a reporter there from CNN who watched and recorded the whole thing. And John went down from the stairs. He leaned down and he embraced the little white boy in his arms. And the CNN announcer said, for some reason, I started to cry. And then I looked around and I saw all of the guards and some of the policemen were crying too. What does it do when you see something like that? Do justice, but love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. In the Catholic Church, there is the right of canonization. And there is a man appointed to be called the Devil's Advocate. And the Devil's Advocate is to look into the life of the person whose name is to be put up there, first with the edification leading to canonization. And they research the person's life because they want to find out, is there any glitch in here that we should know about? And as a result, sometimes it's very long, sometimes it took two years, in one case, it was started and didn't finish for 300 years. Somebody put the papers aside and then found them later on. It really is too bad, isn't it, that all Christianity doesn't know that there should be some people who should be canonized even within the Christian church itself, no matter what the denomination is. The more I heard about John Lewis's life, the more I realized that what we were given was a man who decided that he could not preach the gospel, it wasn't within him, but he would enact it. And the way he enacted it was to take up the freedom of our Constitution and use that instead as a way to act the gospel out. That demand that we all are created equal. That demand that somehow Something has to be said when there is division. A man who understood the words of Paul, he said, in Jesus Christ there's not man, woman, slave, or free, for we all become one in Christ. Every hero needs his hero. And it sometimes is kind of amazing that it only takes the death of that hero, and suddenly all of the story explodes outwardly. And you see a person maybe that you didn't see before, he was seen in the halls of Congress, to be sure. But the full value of us in his life is revealed in his death. And so it is, sometimes it is, that the good works
that Jesus said, let your light shine beyond the door of others so they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so we are left with a sense of bitterness that is lost, but what we have left is truly astounding. A man who not only lived the gospel, but suffered for it, who was able to bring justice in a measure that perhaps nobody else could do. And so, here we have a text this morning of Jesus speaking about how the kingdom of God works, how it happens. Yeast that lies within four, three measures of flour that sooner or later rises to expand itself to feed people. It is the man who finds a treasure in the field and he gives them everything else to buy that field. It is the pearl warrior who sees one gives up everything else because of that pearl of great price. Very few of us have that position in life to ascend to that type of living that John lived. But every life has its moments. Every life has its position to find a pearl of great price or to buy that field, so to speak, to obtain that treasure. And so what we have left is the life of a person who found that pearl. And when he did, it changed his life forever. Life-changing things come so rarely. Most of us live our lives and think, well, this is what it's all about, and this is what Christianity is all about. And perhaps even, well, here I am. I don't need a life-changing experience right at this moment. Nevertheless, it can be a small, life-changing moment. And when it happens, a Ku Klux Klan then sees what he has done and embraces his enemy, and his enemy forgives him. A little 10-year-old white boy suddenly has it within himself to understand what a great person truly is. And that great person leans down and he holds him. And that little boy's life and experience is now forever changed already. At 11 years old, he is out there going for change in his school to increase the amount of free lunches that are given in his school. And so someone said he has now been set up to be yeast in his measures of flour that are given to him. He has been forever set up to carry the pearl of great price that he discovered in a man who discovered it from another man. And so it is that the Word of God does not go up. The Word of God does not sort of be thrown out on the ocean to come back empty, but rather filled with loaves that were filled with yeast that rose and invaded the world. So today, the Gospel brings forth a remembrance of a funeral that is to come, and there will be many things that will be said about the man. But it is for each of us to look at the person and say, what did the gospel do to this man? How did it change his life? And what does it mean to me? What might be that pearl that I haven't found yet, but that's worthwhile to diligently search for it, and upon finding it, find the totality of your own humanity, and to do as the words of our church say, to do justice, to love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Amen. And now, let us pray together. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the Church, the world, and all who are in need.
Thank you. 
Thank you.